Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Manetti Shrine Museum of Art. My name is Ben. I'm a recent art studio and museum studies graduate, and I'm currently serving as a visitor services assistant here at the museum. Before we begin today's program, let us take a moment to acknowledge the land on which UC Davis sits. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Cachaldehi Band of Wintun Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Quetzaldehi Wintun Nation, and Yochadehi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. On behalf of myself and the entire staff of the Manetti Shrine Museum, thank you, for, thank you for joining us today. Welcome everyone. If you could please remember to silence your cell phones, we'll get started. Hello and welcome to the Visiting Artist Lecture Series. My name is Renee LaPro and I'm a first year art studio graduate student. I would like to thank Dean Atakwana and the College of Letters and Science for their support of the speaker series and the Minetti Shrum Museum for co-sponsoring and hosting our lecture. Today, I am pleased to introduce the wonderful Kang Sung Lee. Lee is a multidisciplinary artist who was born in South Korea and now lives and works in Los Angeles. His work frequently engages the legacy of transnational queer histories, particularly as they intersect with art history. In 2023, Lee had solo exhibitions at museums in Seoul and Los Angeles. He is a recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the 2023 Angeles Art Fund Artadia Award and the McDowell Fellowship. His work will be included in the international exhibition at the 60th Venice Biennale. We are honored to have him here with us today. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Kang Sung Lee. Thank you, Renee, for the warm welcome and the introduction. Um, very nice to meet you here. Um, I make project-based works. So usually for each project, I research and reposition uh, various queer archives or collections, also connecting distinct geographies and experiences. And I believe that that can forge new sites of knowledge in the process and I hope basically um, the genealogies represented in my work to manifest in really variety of information from disparate sources. So I'm going to share a few recent projects today, um, starting with this one. So I want to start with uh, some photos of doors and gates and from left to the right. The first one is a door from a prison cell where Oscar Wilde served 18 months before uh, because he did not hide his sexuality at the end of the 19th century in the UK. As you know, it was illegal to be homosexual at that time. Uh, the second one is doors of Stonewall Inn in New York City where there was a riot against the police brutality led by trans people of color in the late 60s. The third one is a photo of Alvin Voltrop. He was a, a African-American photographer who mainly documented the piers in New York City, um, which was a very well-known cruising um, gay cruising site at that time. Um, the fourth one is Samil Moon, it literally means March 1st gate in Korea. Uh, on March 1st, 1919, there was a massive protest against the Japanese occupation by this gate, and it later became a public park and also a very well-known gay cruising ground for many decades afterwards. I've been thinking about art or art practice as a door or gate. Um, what if an artwork or art practice is something we encounter and then we enter and it would lead us to a place or some kind of knowledge that we did not know before. Uh, I usually start with lots of drawings. So uh, underneath you will see my drawings of um, these photographs and that's how I usually start my project and it's part of my thinking process. So 
I wanted to introduce like just a couple of works that I think that really speak for um, my overall practice. And this particular work is titled, Who Will Care for Our Caretakers? Um, it's a sentence that's written by uh, Pamela Sneed. And Sneed is a New York-based queer writer in her 60s now. It comes from one of Sneed's poem written during the pandemic in which she speaks about her experience of the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 1990s. At the time, so many of her gay friends were dying of the disease and also looked after by a community of people, particularly in this case, her friend Greg, who was also a poet who was also, and dying, said, who will care for all these caretakers who are looking after us now? In this embroidery work, the text was transcribed, what I call Martin Wong font. Um, this is American Sign Language font I designed based on Wong's paintings from the 1980s and 90s. And this font appears throughout my recent projects. This is another work that I want to show um, before talking about my recent project. This is a succulent plant uh, that's often called Christmas cactus because they bloom during the winter time. It is also a work of art by my friend and artist Julie Tolentino titled The Archive in Dirt, also known as Harvey. It's a living cactus Julie revived which had been propagated from its mother plant that had originally belonged to the activist Harvey Milk. It came from her friend, an archivist in the special collections at UCLA, who acquired a cutting from Harvey Milk's ex-roommates from San Francisco, who took care of the plant after Harvey Milk was assassinated in 1978. For those who do not know Harvey Milk, he was uh, the first openly gay politician who was elected in California. I saw this work uh, for the first time at the exhibition Altered After, uh, curated by Conrad Van Tour, a participant Inc. in 2019. Uh, at that time, the plant was quite stressed and broken in pieces with just a few leaves in pale green color coming out. Um, since then, with the help of Julie and my other friends, including Yang Chung from Commonwealth and Council Gallery in Los Angeles, I became a participant in the evolution of the work through making ceramic planters and repotting the plant and taking care of cuttings and also sharing them with many other people in my queer community. I've also documented the growth of each plant, making drawings, uh, or embroideries, basically mapping out uh, the connections through the projects. It is an ongoing project, and this is the latest iteration that I included. Um, as you can see, I'm documenting like several plans. Uh, there is an embroidery work and also a stack of uh, photographs on the left side that is basically my correspondence with the caretakers of many different plants. Over the years, I have exhibited Harvey in many different exhibitions. Uh, this is an installation view of my show at the New Museum in 2021. At the time, I hand carried the plant from Los Angeles to New York, and the curators and other staff at the museum took care of the plant during the three months run of the show. When I exhibit Harvey in a gallery space or museums, I'm thinking about the responsibility of caring for the plant, but also passing the responsibility to the staff temporarily. And it becomes labor of care given by a community of people. This is a watch up uh, conversation with the curator at the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul, where a cutting of the Cactus is currently on view. And as you can see, I brought um, a few cuttings last year and they were propagating and also taking care of them and also sending me 
uh, messages and sharing photographs. I find the way we care for this plan is very similar to how we write and rewrite history. As resilient as this succulent plant is, it needs care, caretakers, and constant attention in order to survive. This plant is also in transformation all the time, like our bodies are, growing and just like how memories and histories are always shifting and also in transformation. Um, it's one of my recent project titled The Heart of Hand. The Heart of Hand pays tribute to Ko Chu San, who was a pioneering Singaporean born choreographer who dies of an age related illness at the age of 39 in 1987. He performed and choreographed for many prominent ballet companies throughout Europe, Asia, and the United States during his lifetime. However, the legacy of Ko remains really largely absent from the dance history in the United States since his death. It's quite surprising how unknown he is, especially considering that he was a big star in neoclassical ballet in the late 70s and 80s. And I've asked his old friends why, and they just had like a few theories, one being most likely due to his diasporic identity. He, um, his accomplishment has been more celebrated in Singapore, perhaps fueled by the nationalism there. Um, but his place in queer cultural context in the world is still really vague. Another reason is many of his peers especially his queer peers, uh, including dancers and choreographers of his generation, were really affected by DA's epidemic and wiped, uh, wiped out. So the historicization of their work has been really delayed for that reason as well. Um, and also like how I got to know his life and work tells a lot about um, his life as well. Um, so this, in this picture, you see uh, a few dancers and the person on the left is Mikhail Baryshnikov. Some of you know like how famous Baryshnikov was at that time. So in 1981, Baryshnikov was artistic director and a principal dancer at American Ballet Theater. And they commissioned Ko Chu San a new original work titled Configuration. Um, this work was very focused on male dancers and their technically, technically challenging movements, which was quite new at, uh, because most classical ballets were still very much female-oriented and male dancers uh, took these supporting roles. Um, the same year, this British TV station was filming a documentary about Baryshnikov, and it included about 10-minute long clip um, in which Kochusan appears. I think I watched the documentary possibly 15 to 16 years ago and was like, who is this person? And tried to find information about you know, him and his work through Googling and all of that, but the research really didn't go anywhere until I met Singaporean um, brand curator Wang Bing Hao around 2019. And through the connections made by Bing and other Singaporean queer artists, I was able to get in touch with Ko Su Kim, uh, who's Ko Chu San's sister, and Yanek Shergen, uh, who's a friend of uh, Ko Chu San's and who's now a creative director of Singapore Ballet, and learned really a lot about particularly the last years of Ko Chu San's life in New York City. Like the fact that he had a long-term partner, Robert Mackey, who died several months um, before Ko Chu San did of AIDS, and how their friends really looked after one another during these times. Um, these photos you're seeing were never published, and uh, I was able to uh, use these materials for my project 
uh, with permission of the family members and his friends. I'm gonna show you like a short excerpt of video work. <laughs> So the central project of um, the project was this video installation, also titled The Heart of Hand, that was made in collaboration with Joshua Serafin and Nathan Mercury Kim. Joshua Serafin is a Filipino dancer, choreographer, based in Belgium, uh, originally classically trained in ballet and contemporary dance, but became a theater and performance artist. And Nathan is also a dancer, choreographer, but also a filmmaker based in Los Angeles. I wanted to make a piece that really embodies through many different spectrum of emotional and physical states of belonging, basically. But also uh, something that's about togetherness and kinship with Gochusan's life and work. The work is um, also in collaboration with many other artists from my queer community, both in Los Angeles and Seoul. For example, the music that you just heard is made by Kirara, a transgender composer based in Seoul. And they took inspiration from Samuel Barber's Concerto for Piano, um, which was the original music for Gochusan's configurations. And I wanted to make sort of a soundtrack for queer life, thinking about um, dance space, thinking of dance for as communal state of temporality um, of many queer people and their lives lived. Um, the piece also is composed with an animated text by Mexican poet Javier Villarutia. Uh, it's titled Nocturne, and it's transcribed by Martin Wong Font, um, the Martin Wong American Sign Language Font that was adapted um, from Wong's paintings. I think Villarutia's uh, text, Nocturne, was really about memory and the memories in your own body, not through particularly about our brain, but touch and memories that we kind of remember holding someone's hands or something that we remember through our body, um, or smell, which I thought was very much related to um, the idea of our you know, erased memories about queer community and all these people who are not with us anymore. The project also included several works on goat skin parchment. So each work is made on a parchment from one animal. Um, this is why you know, all these works have different shapes and sizes. And uh, it used graphite drawings, watercolor, and they were, uh, each work also had this small embroidery uh, done on sambe. Uh, sambe is this hemp handmade fabric that's used as a funeral shroud in Korea traditionally. And the um, gold thread that I use in this series of works are t called Nishijin and they are this pure gold coated over very thin silk 
uh, and made around 1910 to 1915 in Kyoto. So it's very, very old material, which is also quite important part of uh, my recent projects. Um, in most drawings, human figures are erased or blurred, as you can see. And some of the works uh, memorialize Gochusan's relationships with his partner Robert, his friend Yannick Shirgen, also his very close relationship with his sister Kosu Kim, who was also a ballet dancer and later uh, became a co-founder of Singapore Ballet. This is an embroidery work made based on what's called Banish movement notation. Um, Banish movement notation is kind of notation for dance movement. So it's very similar to musical notation, as you can see, but it's for body movement. So first line is head, the second line is shoulders, the third line is upper body, and then lower body, and feet. Uh, this, this very short notation was made by Yannick Shirgen, Kochusan's best friend, who attempted to record Kochusan's work using this notation. Then I made that into this embroidery piece. There was this uh, sculpture installation that consisted of embroideries, pebbles, and dried seeds, and other found materials. Uh, these dried seeds and plants were collected from a place in Singapore called Fort Road Beach, which was a gay cruising ground for many decades. Uh, and until the 1990s, Singapore police used to send police decoys. Basically, they were pretending to be gay and cruising, and someone approaches them, then they would arrest these people, which was a really common brutal practice that happened in many other cities in the world. One thing that was different in Singapore was that the next day, they would publish the names of these people who were arrested in the Straight Times, which is the largest newspaper in the country that resulted um, in many people's suicide attempts and, you know, um, and also stigmatization um, of sexuality and all of that. Uh, as some of you know, Section 377A, which is an anti-gay law, uh, also British colonial law in Singapore, was only struck down in 2022, just only a couple of years ago. This is another installation view of the project, and the video installation. So after uh, this long-term research about Kochusan, I really wanted to make a work that connects his life to another one who was working on the other side of the planning. So my latest video work titled Lazarus, um, it pays tribute to Kochusan and another artist, Jose Leo Nielsen, a Brazilian conceptual artist known for his very poetic works about love and grief, particularly through a queer lens. Leo Nielsen lived most of his life in Sao Paulo, creating artwork predominantly autobi autobiographical, of his life and experiences as a gay man. Both artists died of AIDS-related uh, illness in the 80s and 90s, respectively. I'm gonna sh share another excerpt of the video. Just 
Sorry about this. We're good, yeah. So the piece you just watched, um, Lazarus, took inspiration from Gochusan's original ballet, Unknown Territory, that was made in 1986. Uh, I worked with this choreographer, Dan Jung, who was trained as a traditional uh, dancer in Korea and moved to the United States. And for that reason, um, she is very much into creating uh, very minimal and intentional movements. Uh, in the video, Lazarus, two dancers interact with this costume reproduced after Leo Nielsen's final work titled Lazaro that was made in 1993, right before he died, um, which is a sculptural installation made of two men's dress shirts sewn together. Uh, the, the piece on the left is, the, is a picture of Leonison's work, and the right one is my drawing of his work. So when I was replicating Leonison's work in Sambe, um, I was, of course, really thinking about how to honor the lives and memories of Leo Nielsen and Ko Chusan, but also a lot of people who are not really remembered, um, who are really erased from the history um, because of their death um, of age-related illness. Um, When I saw Leo Nielsen's work for the first time, I really thought that he made this work as a shroud. Um, he knew that he was dying and making this outfit that is not for one person, but for two. And so I was thinking he was making this piece perhaps from his friend who's dying or his partner or also like many other people who are dying um, all over the world uh, during this time. And I wanted to make several, relate, uh, several works that are related to this one that could be shown at the same time at different places. So last year I was simultaneously having three institutional exhibitions in Paris, Los Angeles, and Seoul and wanted to uh, create something that connect these three dots, um, dots in you know, three different continents particularly. So this is my installation at the Hammer Museum um, and the full work that you are seeing is an installation based on the patterns that are created with the help of my friend's mother who has been a pattern maker for many decades. And since we only had a photo of Leo Nielsen's work, she made the patterns based on my, uh, based on the size of my body. So the work included cut patterns um, made of sambe that's also embroidered in gold thread and juxtaposed with fossil seeds and many other collective materials. Um, we can move on to the next project. It's titled Permanent Visitor. This is Kwan Chi, ladies and gentlemen. He's been doing this kind of thing all over town. And I feel lucky here, but let's, well, let's okay. do it now, okay? okay? Ready? Go. Yes. Look, we're all wires. We have three uh -huh. wires. Yeah. Three person and three wires running out of it. That's more than eight. Just the time she lives. <laughs> Now, let me so see. I have to find my pen here. I think I have one here. No, I have, a, I have one here. We should okay. go. It's much more All right. appropriate, right? I see that you're a visitor here. Uh-huh. I'm a permanent I'm a permanent visitor. Permanent visitor. Yeah, right. You have permanent visitor status. And who's, who's going to be next? Uh, oh.
I think that, like, the, I don't know, there's something about New Yorkers that, you know, um, that makes them crooked and twisted. Yeah. So I got all interested in body language. Uh-huh. Body language is um, New Yorkers in nightclubs and different situations. And, um, well, Keith asked me to do this thing at Club 57, so I thought, well, I'll study the body language of all these people at Club 57, and they were all twisted. So this is a clip um, from 1982. The photographer Seng Gong Chi appears in this live cable TV show that was hosted by Castillo Snekas. Um, Seng Gong Chi was wearing his very typical Nao suit with a slough of art visitor badge on his left chest. As we watched in the video, uh, Snekas asked, I see that you're a visitor here. And Sang answers, yes, I'm a permanent visitor here. According to several accounts, including um, his sister, Muna Sang, Sang Gong Chi disliked identity politics. Apparently, he didn't want to be called an Asian artist. He was also not active in Chinese diasporic artist groups in New York City at all. He was born in Hong Kong in 1950 and lived and studied in British Columbia, Canada, and Paris, France before relocating to New York City in 1978. So I think his refusal to labels is unsurprising. But when I look at his work, it is evident that he was well aware of his place in the mostly white dominated art world as an alien, an immigrant, and a queer. He created this artistic persona, slut for art, um, and also ambiguous ambassador or inquisitive traveler uh, with all these different names. He created this really formal but simultaneously awkward self-portraits in front of all American tourist destinations. He's wearing this costume, so he was successfully infiltrating the power structure of the New York City in some ways, um, crashing very exclusive museum parties and galas, basically saying that he's an ambassador from China, and people actually believe that. He also said all of these self-portrait works and his very flamboyant Asian body in it, calling performing for the camera. When I saw these works for the first time, I thought these images were kind of stinging satire about Americana, particularly these photos um, being taken at destinations that are well known for tourists in um, the US. Um, but later, uh, and also he's wearing sunglasses in this most, most of these pictures, and he claimed that um, these dark sunglasses prevent the viewers from directly interacting with the human figure in the picture. Therefore, his body becomes a performative object. But later, this series actually extends to landscapes such as a Grand Canyon and in this case, Cotton Field in Tennessee. And I see this extremely mesmerizing landscape but also his body that's wearing a visitor badge on his chest. And I think it's also effectively reminding us of the history of colonization and of course the slavery in the South. He died of AIDS-related complications in 1990 at age 39, um, which is a, mon a month after his best friend Keith Haring died from uh, the same disease. Uh, in 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, I found this photograph that you see on the right from a Sotheby's auction titled Dear Keith, um, which was a personal collection of Keith Herring's, and the foundation donated a group of works that were auctioned um, in order to support the LGBT center in New York City. And I was uh, very lucky to acquire this poster um, 
in this picture that was taken in 1980, uh, the inscription on the poster says Polaroided and Xeroxed in New York City and stamped with the artist's Slothful Art stamp on the margin, which was Sang Wong Ji's motto. I later learned that this work was also originally made for an exhibition organized by Keith Haring the same year. The person photographed in this picture was a dancer, choreographer, and costume designer, Sean McQuaid. He was 19 years old at that time and was wearing an outfit that was made by himself. Through Kwong Chi's sister, Muna, I learned that Sean was alive and living in Philadelphia. So I reached out to him in 2020 and started a conversation of the phone. Sean was one of just a handful of people who survived AIDS uh, from the downtown New York Club 57 scene. And he's blind due to HIV-related complications and moved to Philadelphia to get help from his family. In 2021, Sean and I remade the outfit he originally designed and made in 1980. Um, that's just based on his memories of that outfit, uh, being a black dress with silver details and you know all of this. Since he's now blind, there was no sewing involved. So the new outfit was mostly cut and assembled using tape. Then I asked Sean to pose for a video, basically the same pose he did 41 years ago, and asked him to hold it as long as possible. So this, this video was made in October 2021 in Philadelphia, and it's about two minutes, 24 seconds long. And it's Sean trying to hold the position and finally collapses and it goes back to the beginning of the video constantly looping. And the outfit was um, shown in a couple of shows since then with the original photography of Sang Gong Chi and my drawings of the, um, the work as well. Sang Gong Chi's Love for Art became this t-shirt shaped um, painting and also embroidery on Sambe um, saying visitor, slough of art, permanent visitor. And it also became this large neon piece for an exhibition in Korea. So this project that I sh uh, shared um, probably go back to like this particular project that I made in 2016 that's titled Absence Without Leave. Absence Without Leave begin with a selection of iconic representations of male bodies in public and domestic spaces through pho uh, photographs, uh, particularly made from late 1970s through early 1990s. For example, this work is based on uh, a photograph by Leonard Fink of uh, Pier 48 in New York City that was taken in 1980. So my process is I make a um, digital copy of the original photograph with all the human figures erased and then make a small drawing of the photo. And then sometimes it becomes um, just work of art, sometimes I blow up the drawing and mural size and becomes an installation and things like that. So this is my process, you can see. Um, this first one is a photo of Martin Wong taken by Peter Bellamy in 1985 and I used um, Photoshop uh, to blur the image and then make um, graphite copy of that image which is quite small. 
Some of the, these images I selected were more known, such as this portrait of David Wanarowicz by Peter Hussar. Some were less known, like this one based on a photograph by Alvin Baltrop. Like I introduced before, Baltrop documented the peers in New York City um, in the 70s and 80s. And he used uh, black and white photo photography um, and particularly really interested in documenting a marginalized group of young gay men of color. The project also included um, works from different places, such as this one by Nam Jin Kim, taken in Itaewon area of Seoul in the 1980s. Um, so the common thread in these images is that the images were documentation of various queer communities across the world that were affected by the AIDS epidemic. And um, the authors and or subjects of these pictures died of AIDS um, during this time. So I was really thinking about these parallel histories and memories of loss, mourning, perhaps absence, but also their presence in our life. And it's kind of mixed match of very well-known images, such as this one on the left, um, which is a port cell portrait of Robert Mapplethorpe, and I erase um, Mapplethorpe's body from the original image. The right, uh, the one on the right hand side is uh, by William Yang. He's an Australian photographer, and this particular work is titled The Morning After. Uh, Yang documented the lives of queer people in Sydney, Australia, particularly surrounding his Asian Australian gay community. So I think. I was attempting to really talk about um, the dead, the departed, and their absence through this sort of visual dissolve of human figures in the project, but also trying to address their very important presence in art history, but also in our lives, in our memories, um, in this case, in the form of sculpture. So one of the graphite drawings was printed on a blanket and later casted in the shape of a chair, um, which is based on a work of Peter Hujar. So the sculpture is actually hollow inside. It's just casted in the shape of a um, chair. It's an installation view at Common Council. It's a project uh, titled Garden from 2018. So while I was making work um, for Absence Without Leave, I began doing research on the two artists uh, who are Oh Jun Soo in Korea and Derek German from the UK. Um, both men were artists but also activists and the long research resulted in an exhibition um, titled Garden, which included drawings, archival installations, and videos, um, particularly centering the lives and works of these two figures. So let me talk about Ojuns a little bit first. So Ojuns was born in 1964 in Korea and died from age-related complications in 1998. Uh, he was an activist who was part of Chinggusai, which was one of the first gay rights groups in Korea. Oh Jun Soo was also one of the first openly gay activists in Korean history who were open about his HIV status in his lifetime. So when he died in 19, 1998, um, most hospitals in Korea refused to treat AIDS patients and almost all funeral homes also refused to admit their bodies after passing. When he died, Oh Jun Soo's body was cleaned by a group of Catholic nuns and there was a very small gathering for his uh, burial organized by his friends. He was also a writer who published essays under different pen names while he was alive. 
However, most of his works were only published after his passing by his friends. In Odin's writing, which was very eccentric and sometimes explicit, his talk, he talks about his daily walks in Chongno, Tapgol Park, and Namsan, which are all former gay cruising sites in Seoul. He also went by multiple names in his lifetime. He used Ojunsu, Ochangsu, Kim Gyeongmin, Kim Dabin, Luka, Jongno Badage Kole, which can be translated as slut in Jongno. So I decided to make a neon work using all of the names Ojunsu used in his lifetime as one name. So the names are separate but also together all at the same time. Ojunsu was really known to be eccentric, strong, humorous, but also his writings revealed the extreme loneliness that he was feeling, especially towards the end of his life. Like in this letter uh, sent to his friend right before he died, he writes, I feel always afraid of being forgotten. I'm afraid of vanishing from people's memory. Still, they will continue living their lives as if nothing had happened. I cannot stand it. I hate it. So it's a work based on his letter. So it works as text, but also it's a large size drawing that's about the size of my body. Another person um, that is important in this project is Derek German, and their stories are kind of parallel. Obviously, um, Derek German is much more known. In 2017, I was invited to stay at Prospect Cottage, also known as Derek German's Garden, in Dungeness, England. The invitation came from Keith Collins, who was Derek German's partner, who had taken care of the cottage and the garden since Derek died of age-related complications in 1994. They had moved to the cottage right after Derek was diagnosed HIV positive in the, na in the late 1980s. In 1980. This cottage is located in a very small fishing town called Dungeness Beach with an endless expense of pebbles. Um, because of very strong winds from the English Channel, there are no trees living on this part of the country. In this garden, you can also see the nuclear uh, power station called Dungeon SB. And Derek and Keith lived there until Derek's death. Since then, Keith nurtured and cared for the place really quietly until his sudden passing of brain tumor in 20. 18. It's a work based on a picture of um, Keith. So the story of Prospect Cottage and the Garden is really well documented through Derek's book, Mother Nature, and also other uh, friends' works such as Howard Sully's uh, photos. However, only a few people know that Keith actually spent the next 20, 25 years taking care of this garden and the cottage. This was one of the central works in the um, project titled Garden. Um, and in this video, which is also documentation of my performative acts, I go back and forth between locations in Seoul and Dungeness. And the videos are a few clips and documentation of my ex that are burials of graphite drawings on sheepskin parchment um, at these locations. So the burials start from digging the ground using my bare hands. I collect soils from these sites and wrap in sambe. Um, Then I cut my drawings in half and bury one half of it and take the other half with me. It's an installation view of the show. 
These are the remains of the drawings that were shown um, the same exhibition. I also moved small pebbles from Seoul to Dungeness and from Dungeness to Seoul. And some of these pebbles um, became subjects of large graphite drawings, also about the size of my uh, body, one from Dungeness and the other one from Tatpo Park in Seoul. And they were shown along with uh, ceramic vessels made out of soils that I collected from Tatpo Park, Namsan Park, Prospect Cottage um, that were mixed with California clay. And a few pebbles with holes were suspended from ceilings using antique gold thread from Kyoto. Um, this pebble with a hole is called holy hole in Dungeness. And Derek and Keith collected them, made various assemblages using them. And some sambe fabric became this hammock shaped sculpture with, with gold uh, embroideries. Um, this piece, particularly, uh, I made it using the pattern of embroidery from a curtain at uh, Prospect Cottage. And there were more collected materials, such as dried and pressed plants and flowers, more ceramic vessels, pebbles, and more drawings. Also embroidery tracing flowers and plants from Dungeness and Seoul that were mixed together. And this work particularly included the list of flowers planted by Derek German's garden, Derek German uh, in his garden. And I basically embroidered tracing Derek's handwriting uh, from his book. There was also this installation of archival materials um, given to me by Odinsu's friends, such as his diary, scrapbook, photographs, books, and a ring. So each of these Objects on the table belongs to, belong to a different person, and with the help of all this group of friends, I was able to assemble all these um, materials as one work of art. Another installation view. So I'm just gonna share um, one more project um, titled Queer Arch. Um, so apart from making my own work, I also collaborate and also arrange um, programs and um, other works uh, for this archive called Queer Arch. Um, so for the past few years, I've been collaborating this particular archive called Queer Arch. It's called Queer Arch in Korean, also known as the Korean Queer Archive, which is based in Mapo, Seoul. And it's a really interesting and quite unique archive in that the archive was originally initiated by a group of women and transgender people in the 1990s. So the archive has been open mostly to writers and academics since 2002, but they didn't really have any resources for public uh, programming. So the goal of my collaboration with them is to create a space for the public to engage with its archival materials through exhibitions, sometimes artist talks or publications. Um, in 2019, I worked with a group of young queer artists based in Korea, and they made new works out of their research at the archive. This particular work was made by sculptor Che An Il, and in this case, he made a new set of bookshelves and display system as an installation work, which was later donated to the archive um, after the show was closed. 
So for this exhibition, uh, the participating audience and I worked together uh, with a few questions in mind. How do we challenge the narrow perspectives of the bias Korean history or art history and also resist the discursive and academic violence that has resulted in the historical erasure of queer people in Korea? How do we honor the lineage of queer people in Korea and the history also successfully create narratives through artworks? This is um, two video works made by um, one by performance artist Ah Jang Min, who dives into the history of drag king performances in Korea. Ah Jang Min was often introduced as one of the first drag king artists in Korea. But knowing there were so many drag kings before her, she decides to track down all drag kings of former generations and interviews them in her work and title this work, Touching the Balls of Resurrected Drag Kings. So during the whole run of the exhibition, Ruin, the archivist of uh, Queer Arch, um, who's also a transgender researcher, used the gallery as their office. So working there and giving tours to the viewers every day. And in 2020, I continued this collaboration through other projects. Um, this one is titled Covers, and uh, in which I scanned the entire publication collections of the archive and created this wallpaper installation. Um, using the five-story staircase of this museum in Korea. This installation also included a large graphite drawing of a diary um, that is currently part of the collection at the archive. Um, it was donated by a transgender woman in 1998 uh, who visited the office of Buddy um, which was one of the first queer themes magazines in South Korea. This diary included multiple drawings by the donor, uh, mostly self-portraits of the body she desired to have. And in 2021, I'm, I continued this collaboration as part of my, part my participation in the Gwangju Biennial. So when I was invited, I um, split the space that was given to me by half, and I exhibited my work uh, in one half of the space, and I gave the other half to the archive so that they could um, show and share their materials and organize their own programmings. A few other installation views. So this exhibition um, that was part of Gwangju by Neil included this really large wallpaper installation, um, which consist consisted of about 350 articles from this tabloid. Um, it's called Sunday Seoul. Uh, Sunday Seoul was a Korean weekly adult magazine published between 1968 and 1991 that was really known for its explicit content. Um, at the time, the Korean mainstream media entirely ignored the, exist the exist existence of the queer community and their history. And these articles that were very often erroneously written um, surprisingly work as archival traces of queer lives in South Korea. So I juxtaposed the wallpaper installation with drawings of um, one of the Harvey drawings um, and a drawing of William Dorsey Swan, who was one of the first drag queens in the United States, who um, was also born as a slave in the South around 1858, and who later became a gay liberation activist. Okay, I think this is the end of my presentation.
question. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk uh, and like explaining your process. So my question is that like your conceptual interest lies with like historical archives. Uh, which like challenge the stigma or bias that is present in a heteronormative society. Uh, while your way of thinking or like filtering through those archives seem to do a lot with drawing. So I would like to hear, uh, I'm curious to hear a little bit more on like um, how these two things work in your process. So um, your question is about the research and how particularly my drawings work together in this process? Um, really good question. I'm obviously making visual art you know, from my research and drawing and making sort of, not exactly the same copies, but some sort of drawings out of that is a process of what I would call um, my attempt to embody these histories. So. These drawings are, like I explained the process, uh, there's more what people all, uh, people would call a conceptual process, which is a research part of um, the project, but also labor process, which is me making basically like copy of these images, which I would usually call mechanical. So it's labor process using my body and creating this special relationship between the images and my own body. Um, but at the same time, I think that that is only partially true because the mechanical process of labor creates a pretty large space to think as I'm doing this uh, sort of repetitive lines of works and uh, having done a lot of drawings in my life, it's almost like just in a really easy process, making a copy of these images. Um, so that during that time, I think that I'm really thinking about the research and about these people. So I think it's a, like mixture of something that's conceptual, but also something crafty at the same time. So you mentioned at the beginning that you felt part of the art practice is to lead you to knowledge that you previously didn't have. And I was just curious about what you felt maybe you, you learned or gained from some of these exhibitions. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so my projects are really, other than anything, is for myself, I think. So the research process, of course, sometimes is very intense, sometimes easier, but I do that in order to learn. So, you know, it's really for me to learn something, but also like I use visual art to share uh, my research and this way of something visual, which I think opens up kind of different space compared to writing histories, you know? And that opening the door actually comes from this interview that I watched <laughs> that was uh, done um, by Laurie Anderson, and she talks about this Tibetan philosophy uh, about life and death, particularly, and in Tibetan philosophy, uh, they talk about what is living space and what is um, space for the dead. And it's almost like uh, two different sides of this door. So when we enter, when we open the door and move into the next space, that's what life and death. And there's no such a thing like living inside the door. Everyone is either one side or the other side. There's no one inside that door. But when I saw that interview, immediately I thought about actually the space inside the door, you know? And some people's lives or some people's experiences or 
art or art practice could actually become part of the door and work as the door for something else, you know? And that's enough for some art or uh, some art practice. And that was very touching to think about because I really have been thinking about my work and different projects as a way of opening door, one for myself, like explain, explain, but also for other people to enter. Therefore, we learn something. And in the process of that, we there's a possibility for us to change something. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful presentation, Kang. I wanted to ask you a complicated question about um, the law, but the law understood in an abstract way, but the law in terms of ownership and in terms of um, the construction of queer communities. Um, in your work, you have uh, been talking about the erasure of queer artists and in your effort to make them visible, you also present them erased, blurred, and um, you know, make it necessary for people to, to look for those, these images and to learn of these histories. And it's a way to care for these artists and for their work. And um, to form communities across time and to form queer communities um, towards the future and towards the past. Um, and queer communities have always existed in this very blurred space, um, always struggling in front of the law and always having to challenge the law and always being challenged by everyone. Um, what right do you have to talk about this? What right do you have to um, speak of this? What right do you have to represent these artists? And you're moving through continents, you're moving through spaces that um, no matter where it is, have uh, failed these artists. Mm -hmm. But once you represent these artists, um, you enter that space where the discussion um, brings everything back to the law and to the right, to right as if right, modern right ever um, protected queer communities and queer communities existed within that right. And so could you speak a little bit about this difficult um, process? Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult question. It's a, it's a great question, but also I think it really depends on the project. Um, so many of my projects require sometimes short periods, some other times like very long process of research and because I'm talking about people who are not with us anymore, I would have to reach out to the living ones. So I think it becomes also a process of creating trust between myself and the friends or family members of the dead, you know? So I think for me, that process is quite important because I'm entering a space of something else, one being I'm creating my own relationship with these people who are depart who departed, but also people who are living, you know, which can be very complicated. Um, it sometimes takes a really long time to establish the tr trust um, as I'm eventually making works out of that, which is quite complicated, you know? So I think there's always this notion of like, what's the point of making art out of this research? Eventually it's authored by me, and I'm so like, I'm blurring the authorship because each of my work has reference to something that exists before. But also I'm um, really interested in this idea of artwork that I'm making in the 21st century being something about that exists before, because I really believe in this idea that there's nothing new, that everything was already created 
by someone, even if they are visually different. I think the, the thought that we have, the conversations we have now are only possible because of people who came before us, who sort of create a space for us, for us to think certain ways. So I'm open thinking about that space a lot and what it means to create something visual. Um, what I believe in, obviously, visual art, the potentiality of visual art, you know, that's creating a space that's extremely difficult to describe, something that's about our bodily reaction to histories, bodily, you know, reaction to um, these conversations. And there's so much openness of making art rather than just writing about what what actually happened. You know, I know that like I'm not really answering directly to your questions, and um, but those are the things that I, I often think about um, when making work myself. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. I'm wondering if you could speak um, to the use of sign language, the visual representation of sign language, and you know the significance of that in your work. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, like I, I mentioned, like the sign language and you know their appearance in my work really started from. Uh, not my work, but like Martin Wong's um, work from the 80s and 90s. And most of his later paintings include text written in English, but also in sign language. In his very distinct stylized um, you know, figures of hands. And I think at the time, I'm just guessing that Martin Wong was really thinking about how to expand your own own community or like how to expand yourself through your artwork. One being like he was actually, um, what well, he, he called himself um, Chicano Chinese because he's actually quarter um, Mexican and you know, three thirds Chinese. You know. And he was, he, it's the subjects of his figurative paintings were mostly Latino men a lot of times. So he was always like trying to think about how to expand yourself um, through your work, reaching out to different communities, talking about these beings, otherized bodies and racialized bodies. And I think including sign language was one way of doing that. So he would write all texts in two different languages. So I was definitely thinking about the legacy of Martin Wang's particularly, but also, of course, designing this font based on Wang's work and using that as catalyst for several works of mine. And um, the way I use his font is to narrate different texts that are also researched and found through um, the research. So I'm actually... Uh, making connections between Martin Wong and the subject of um, the projects, like Ko Chusan, the choreographer that I mentioned, but also um, a group of writers from the same generation. So it's kind of like my way of layering all these different histories um, through this work and also connecting all these dots you know, from many different places. Um, because I believe when you juxtapose all these things that seemingly dis in a disparate, there's always something coming out of putting this together, you know? And I think that's the power of visual art as well. You know, there's a, when you put two different images, there's always new meaning that's created through that juxtaposition. So that's what I'm interested in, I think.
to, to bounce. Oh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it's, oops, sorry. <laughs> loud noises. Okay, hi. Um, so uh, to bounce off that question, uh, I was just I was curious if you were familiar with Joseph Grigley's critique of Martin Wong's use of ASL. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. There were errors. Yeah. yeah. And then I was so then um, and one of them being sign is this language of movement, right? And and Wong does freeze it into a font like system, right? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So I'm curious about when you animate it, mm -hmm. um, if you are thinking about that and the movement of the of the font in any way and if you're trying to kind of um, yeah, bounce yeah. off that, that notion of yes, the definitely, potential. Yes, definitely. I'm thinking about, I'm very well aware, aware of the critique on Martin Wong's sign, his use of sign language and also there are actually two, two errors um, in his design of sign language and I actually use the error as they are. I thought a lot about you know, how to design if I want to correct these errors and at the end I decided not to but also mention it like every time I have a chance you know that we made mistakes and also like the language being static um, and wanted to give uh, movements to that and looking at it, this each font as body and sort of like find a way to create movements out of them. Um, so that's just one way of doing that for me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was really interested in how across like through your projects and how they evolve, um, you bring in more historical figures of more different people and it seems to me like across a lot of your projects, like a lot of the people can be connected um, by their experiences. Um, so I'm curious about like how you decide where a project ends and another one starts and uh, what the significance of that is for you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think it's, <laughs> to be really honest, it, Honest, it's really about accessibility to um, these people that I'm looking at like, I have like many other encounters to may, uh, many of these artists, you know, sometimes through books, sometimes through friends, sometimes through other artists, um, sometimes just like Gochusan, I was watching this documentary of someone else's and I find this person. And all of these stories have like potential potentiality of like becoming um, a project for me, but also in reality, um, there's very limited accessibility to the estates or to the research and things like that. And so there's um, something you know that's really realistic. Like if I could create uh, trust with the friends or family members of certain people and what I was thinking during that time and whose story connects to someone else. Um, so it's almost like trying to create a map in my mind, you know, connecting dots and, um, but I think within almost all projects, what I'm always thinking about is, I'm obviously talking about the past and that has strong connection with the present that we are living and what we're learning at this present moment. But I think all of the project, in my opinion, <laughs> are kind of pointing towards the future. So it's so much about how I want to collectively imagine the future for us. So thinking about the past and the legacy of all these people, like what kind of future do we want to imagine you know, or can we imagine? So I think that becomes the focal point almost all the time, you know, that how I want to imagine the future, particularly through collaborations with the people who are with me at this present moment. So I think that's where, you know, the projects, many of them become collaborations rather than just work of mine. If we 
we have time if anyone has another question. Um, so you, you gave us a lot of research and background information on all of these figures. Um, I'm wondering how much of that do you include in your shows? Do you let the, the pieces tell that for you or do you give uh, the, the patrons of your um, exhibits like that information up front? It's um, a very good question. I don't know if you noticed, like a lot of my works have long titles and they're almost all of them are untitled but has information in it, it's really slash and something. So I always give um, basic information about the work through titles. Um, it could be you know, the title of uh, referenced images or the person that I'm talking about and all of that. And each project, of course, comes with maybe two paragraphs or three paragraphs of like statements that mostly give information you know about the research and about the people that i'm talking about having said that i'm really not really interested in that part that much you know because i think essentially i'm making visual art and i believe that they need to function as they are visually and sometimes people don't read you know and, and i think that's really fine there's sort of sense of something people describe as like feeling of loss or something weird or, you know, I think that's really enough. And if the viewers live with that feeling, um, for me, like the project did um, its work. And I think like visual art should also function um, visually, you know, or bodily, that it's not just visual, right? We hear and also we smell and all of that. And hoping that like the, the shows work that way as well. Yeah, okay, final question. Oh, this is just, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> this, I, I, I wasn't gonna ask a question, but then um, I just, I, I, I was really moved by what you just said. And I mean, about by, by all of your work and, and um, just he hearing you talk about it, so thank you so much. But I, I'm curious um, if um, if people are encountering your work and not um, not reading or not knowing the history and still c connecting to that feeling of mourning and loss, if, if you um, consider that an invitation or an opportunity for them to sort of project their own mourning and loss and grief mm -hmm. into the work, and if that's something that you think about when you're when you're making the work and, and thinking about showing it. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I'm thinking a lot about the notion of moving on uh, in my work, and I think that's like such a, an American thing, the, the, the expression moving on, uh, because that expression kind of make this distinction of something happened and something after, you know, that we always say like we have to move on, you know, but I think there is something that's completely impossible of moving on, that we actually live with the debt, we are always thinking about it, we are living without memories, and we are never living just one moment. I think we're living many different moments and temporalities all the time, and I think we should be able to talk about it. Like my dad died, I think 21 years ago now. And I think about him almost every day, to be honest, you know? And I, for a long time, I thought about it as something wrong, something that I have to move on from. But I think also there's something really beautiful about living these different moments and different memories. Um, so I think uh, if someone leaves um, the exhibition, thinking about loss of thinking about their own feelings, I think that is really great. Sometimes people live with one information, like I've been told many, many times they encountered Sang Gong Chi, the Hong Kong born photographer's work for the first time through my work. And then they Googled his name and then learned about his work. And in some cases that happens, and I think 
like I feel amazing when I learned that. You know, if someone could encounter someone else's work who came before me through my work, you know. So I think like I hope my work has different functions <laughs> in that way. Okay, that was amazing. Let's all give another really big round of applause. Thank you, Thank you so much for staying long. Yeah.